Future Conversation webinar. Thanks for joining. We have four amazing presenters today. I sent you all of their bios already uh, via email, so I won't take the time to do long introductions now. Uh, you can also connect with the presenters and with each other through the LinkedIn group that I created yesterday at the request of, of some of you. If you didn't receive an invitation to be part of the LinkedIn group, check your junk folder. Uh, also check and see what email account you have listed on LinkedIn. Make sure that you and I are connected because I can't invite you to it unless you're a connection of mine. And if you still haven't found the invite, just send me an email and we'll get it figured out. My email, if you don't have it, is Suzanne, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E, at huntgreenllc.com. So quick housekeeping. Uh, we're keeping attendees on mute, but you can communicate with us through the chat feature of WebEx. If you're signed in through your computer, there's a toolbar that becomes visible at the top center of your screen when you put your cursor there. On the toolbar, you'll see the chat icon to the right. You can communicate with us privately or publicly through, through it by using the drop-down menu for either. This is how you should submit questions for the speakers, and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for Q&A after their presentations. Um, you can submit the questions to the name Pat Courtney Strong, who's letting us use her WebEx graciously. Thank you, Pat. Um, and we'll take all the questions at the end. If you're connected via telephone only, you can email questions to me. Uh, and again, it's Suzanne at huntgreenllc.com. Um, and we'll get to as many of the questions as we can. Um, let's see. Um, if anything does happen, if you get disconnected, for any reason, just log back in. Uh, if anything happens to your audio or visual on your end, feel free to use the chat box or email uh, to ask questions. Uh, we have Melissa Herrera, who's helping us with tech support today, and she'll be able to respond and help you through the chat box. One last thing, we're recording the webinar today, so uh, if folks, uh, if you know folks that want to hear it, we will be sending um, the slides and the recording around by Monday. So let's get started. Our first presenter today is Emily Bakian Landsberg from Ultra Capital. Emily, are you ready? Are you unmuted? Oh, I was muted. Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to the West Coasters. All right, thanks, Emily. Excellent. Let's um let's actually start on slide two here. So I'm going to be speaking about project finance and how you might be able to use it as a tool to finance certain types of infrastructure projects that you want in your community and how to sort of best retain some of that wealth within your communities. And um, I'm going to provide a very high level overview. There's all different types of money and applications for each type of money and um, investors associated with each type of money. And so I'm going to be providing an overview of what project finance is and how it's typically structured so that you can determine is this a, a type of capital that is useful for you in your, in your work. Um, a brief overview of Ultra Capital. We are a private equity fund that invests equity in or cash in infrastructure projects that have a beneficial environmental impact and are in energy, water, waste, and agriculture sectors. And we're, I'm using air quotes so you can't see, but we're small to mid-size infrastructure projects. So in the project finance world, small to mid-size is, let's say, $3 million to $150 million. And most of the projects are in that sort of 30 to $70 million range. So, um, if you skip down to slide five, um, a lot of times you hear the term private equity, and often that refers to corporate level investment or growth equity. And you might hear terms like venture capital, angel investors. Um, these are corporate level investors who invest in companies and, and own stock in companies that um, provide a product or a service or have developed a technology that they're licensing, and those investors typically achieve their returns through appreciation of that stock, through um, growth of the company, and then eventually selling their shares through an IPO or acquisition or something like that. Infrastructure investors don't invest at that corporate level. Um, infrastructure investors invest in 
physical infrastructure that uh, might be affiliated with that, um, that corporate company. Um, and we draw a box around um, the infrastructure and create what we call a special purpose entity or special purpose vehicle, which is essentially just a fancy way of saying it's a, it's a company or an LLC that we put around just that infrastructure that's associated with all the revenues that come into that infrastructure and all the costs that go out and the profit that that infrastructure itself generates. And so an infrastructure investor will achieve their returns through the operations of the infrastructure itself. So the margin between the inputs and the outputs to that physical equipment. And if you skip to slide six now, so you might say, okay, well, that's really great, but what is, what do you mean a, a infrastructure project? Um, and you look at the, the gray band at the bottom of this. When, when we talk about a project, we're talking about physical infrastructure that's functioning as a standalone business. So it's taking some kind of input and converting it into some kind of output in, through a physical process. And so in the diagram above, you can see the input might be a source of revenue or it might be a cost. An output might be a source of revenue or it might be a cost. It might be a, the output might be a thing or it might be a service. And the profits are the money that's made on the spread between those inputs and those outputs, minus the, the cost to actually run the system. And so if you move to slide seven, I'm gonna give you a couple examples of what I mean for these um, infrastructure projects. So this is an anaerobic digester. So you're putting in some sort of organic waste and you're getting paid typically a fee for that waste. Um, to, to treat it and process it, so that's a revenue stream. And you're converting that into electricity and compost and selling the electricity and the compost. So you're getting revenue um, on the output too in this case. If you go to the next slide, you can see um, a greenhouse. So your input is seeds and energy and fertilizer. Those are expenses that you're, you have to buy those things. And then you have a, a greenhouse that's taking those inputs and turning them into tomatoes and you're selling those tomatoes, so you've got, you've got revenue on your output. And I've got a couple other examples here that we can always come back to. Um, if you move through slide nine and 10 um, and you go to slide 11, I wanna take a second here and explain, um, this is an infrastructure enabled service offering. So the output here, the example is, um, is uh, municipal street lighting, converting municipal street lighting into high efficiency uh, LED street lights. And so the output here is actually a service. It's the lighting that's the service of the light is sold to a municipality under a long-term contract. Um, and it's enabled by the infrastructure, by the switch of those street lights from um, the uh, conventional bulbs to the LED bulbs. So I, I put this in just as an example that it, it's, the output isn't always a, a thing, it might be a service. So move to slide 12. Um, you'll hear, hear people talk about the capital stack and I wanna break down what some of this jargon is here. So the capital stack just means what are the types of financing, what are the types of money that are financing this project and, and who are the players providing those. And so typically you'll have um, a, on the simplest level, let's say two or three um, folks in the capital stack. You'll have um, debt coming from a lender. So let's say a bank or a bond loans the money money, loans the project money. Um, you'll have an equity provider that's putting cash directly in and, and owning the interest in the project. So sort of owning the shares in that project company. And that might be private equity, it might be individuals. And then you have a project developer who's the one who's putting the project together and coordinating everything and managing it. And, and often they're not necessarily putting cash in, they're often putting their sweat equity in. If you go to the next slide, 13, you've got um, different, um, you've got a waterfall for how the profits are allocated among the capital stack. And waterfall is another one of those jargony terms that people use, and it just means the, the path through which those profits flow 
um, and sort of how they're allocated. So typically the money, money um, coming out of the operation of the business first goes to pay the debt service, so pay back the loan and installments. And then um, after each installment is made, the remainder goes first to the equity investors and it goes to pay back the, the money they put in and then um, help them achieve certain financial returns. And um, as those returns are met and as that money is paid back, the remaining money flows to the project developer, who again may not have put cash in, but put their efforts and expertise in and get a share of the cash flow there. So slide 14 shows how the developer makes money. So they might, in the beginning, they might um, spend some of their own money and time to develop the project and put it together. And then once the project reaches financial close, which is sort of when it's truly shovel ready and starts construction, all the documents are signed, all the permits are acquired, all of that, then the financial investors might reimburse the developer for their cost to develop it and then maybe pay them a, a margin for that. And then they get, the developer gets a share in the profits from the facility. It's sometimes called a carry in the facility. And you'll see in this diagram that there's a, an upward trend here of the profit share because as the investor, the, the private equity project finance investor hits their return requirements, more and more of the profit share goes to the developer. You go to slide 15. Um, you can see for the investor, that's, um, it's, it's sort of the opposite. The investor has a big capital outlay at construction to reimburse the developer for the development costs and go to, um, can you move to slide uh, 15? Um, and go to um, the developer and then the profit share from the operation of the infrastructure starts high and then as they hit their returns, they get less and less of the profit share as more of that profit share goes to the project developer. Um, if you move to slide 16, um, what, this is speaking to ultra capital in particular, but you can generalize to um, private equity and project finance are looking for predictability in cash flows, which is another way of saying lower risk. And so the way that's achieved is through, um, con in project finance, is through contracting those inputs and outputs so that you have over a long period of time, long term is in this case 10 years, 15 years, even 20 year contract length with credit worthy counterparties, so folks who are going to be there for those, that time period, for those inputs and outputs with price certainty. So it's not just there's a volatility in the market and we're gonna play the, the market prices, there's certainty around the price that's gonna be paid for those inputs and outputs so that that margin is, um, is locked in. And so we skip down to slide 18 here. Um, this shows um, the lower risk it is, the um, lower the return needs to be to that investor. And so as a project developer, you can think of if I can reduce the risk in a project, then I get to keep more of the money for myself. And so the, the, um, we're just about out of time here. I'm gonna, um, I've got one more slide, I think. But the bottom of the slide shows different techniques for reducing the risk in the project, which will allow you to, to keep more of that, um, more of the profits for yourself. Um, so, and that the um, uh, slide, uh, whoops. Um, slide 19, just, just a, a brief overview of for, um, for private equity project finance, typically they, they deploy capital at construction. And so you need to find um, funding to fund the development in sort of um, year one here, you can see. Um, and then the orange is where the private equity comes in. And then um, in the later years, the uh, operating profits from the facility itself funds the operation. So um, my contact info is on slide 22. And um, later in the webinar, I look forward to taking your questions on this. All right, thank you, Emily. All right, our next presenter is Holmes Hummel. Holmes, are you unmuted?
Can you hear me, Suzanne? Yep. Okay, good. Well, good morning to the folks on the West Coast and afternoon on the East Coast. I'm honored to follow Emily, always a leading light in our field. I learn something new every time we have a chance to cross paths. And I certainly appreciate the invitation to join this group and this particular session. Uh, financing became a topic that I uh, grew more serious about pursuing professionally uh, during my period of service in the Obama administration as the senior policy advisor in the Department of Energy's policy office. And during that period of time, the Recovery Act both surged and then subsided. And what we found is that the money that had been devoted to stimulate clean and economy activity in the areas of the country that frankly needed the economic opportunities the most were the first to be stranded when those resources started to recede. And the only way to sustain the level of investment in those communities was to look at the private sector capital flows that could reach them through the financing mechanisms that we knew would be required to cover the capital costs of all of our clean energy solutions, whether it's rooftop solar or uh, energy efficiency, or frankly, community-owned assets that might be um, as large as the tens of millions of dollars uh, that Emily was just describing. Suzanne, I think you're the person advancing the slide, so go ahead and move us forward to a picture of the basic hurdle. Oops, sorry. That's fine. That's fine. Right here is okay. I think if you tap it one more, that might be a little more information. But the, the basic hurdle is still there. Basically, you have to clear the upfront cost even after all of the rebates have been taken into account. And though this slide shows some incomplete text in the headline, it basically says in order to facilitate these long-term capital assets being installed, especially in places that need access to the clean energy economy the most, we have to be able to finance those upfront costs, even for people who may not qualify. And that's the next slide. So go ahead and tap through the three questions that are on the next slide. Are you a renter? Do you have a good credit score? And do you have solid income? These are the three disqualifying questions for half of America. In fact, half of Americans under median income are disqualified even after the first question. And so it's not actually a wonder at all that a large number of people in the United States don't identify with the opportunities that we may see in the burgeoning clean energy economy. They may actually be resistant. They may actually be resentful of the people who are participating in the benefits by using their discretionary income for luxury products that they stick on their roofs and then brag to their friends about because they're forced in a like morally superior disposition whereby the neighbors who are struggling to get by say, well, gosh, you know, I would have if I could have. So it became important to me in the wake of the Recovery Act to find financing solutions that would be able to reach everyone, regardless of their renter status, their income, or their credit score, which is not easy to do. We went to Wall Street and we asked every one of the smartest people we could find. It took a very long time to come up with one good lead and it was in Kansas. So move ahead to the next slide, and you'll see a pair of pie charts that give you a sense of the disqualification scale that I was just describing, where uh, based on the home ownership alone, you'll lose about half of the Americans under median income from any value proposition that would involve their stake and claim in the clean energy economy. Some people have become very enthusiastic about uh, Community solar, by the way, for low income. I was in Florida for the National Conference of Energy Assistance Managers last week. Uh, I learned there that the largest low income community solar program in the country serves 47 families. So this is a problem that has to have a solution at a different scale. If you move forward one slide, you'll see the scale that I'm thinking about, and it is one that you can see from space. The pictures there on the right show you how ubiquitous grid services in the places where it's available. And there are plenty of places, especially in Southeast Asia, where you have exceptionally distressed uh, local economic conditions, and still energy services are being delivered. And the reason why is the financing instrument that's being applied is a tariff, a terms of service agreement. And what's important about that is that a tariff 
does not have the same terms as a promissory note or a loan. So in Emily's presentation, you saw the prominent role of lenders. And lending can be a powerful tool for mobilizing capital for large-scale projects that have count credit-worthy counterparties. But when we're working with a much larger expanse in the marketplace, and especially thinking about inclusive financing for distributed energy solutions, things that are on the customer side of the meter, qualifying every customer as a credit-worthy counterparty is a very expensive administrative transactional piece to undertake. So using the utility tariff eliminates a lot of that friction and allows us to basically move capital to everybody who's connected to the grid. If you move to the next slide, you'll see how that transaction path works. And go ahead and tap through the cycle here. The utility is drawing in large amounts of low-cost capital from the regular sources of capital they use every day to keep the lights on. That's a multi-billion dollar pool of capital daily. The utilities are able to invest in anything that's cost effective on the customer side of the meter, Recap solar, on-site storage, possibly mobile storage, we've been looking at transit buses lately, uh, and definitely building efficiency upgrades, which are almost always the most cost effective clean economy investment we can make. Well, the investments that they make are not assigned to a person. They're assigned to the meter at that site. And the tax terms, since it's a terms of service agreement that allows them to make the investment, also allows the utility to recover its costs over a period that is less than the useful life of the upgrades with the charge on the bill that's capped at less than the estimated savings from the upgrade. So there's a cash flow positive stream of benefits going to the customer from the very beginning. That also assures that the next customer who comes along will be better off. And that's important because successor customers who come along have to be better off or else they may refuse to pay or want to claim that the, the prior investor injured them. In fact, the prior investor has created a benefit stream for them, and that's what has made it possible for successor customers to come along to an upgraded site, receive all of the benefits, and still have enough money to pay for the utilities cost recovery. Go ahead to the next slide, and I'll show you an example. I just keep, keep tapping through, that's fine. For friends on the phone, what you'll see here is the value proposition that people receive at the doorstep. I'll move through it very quickly, but it's here for your reference primarily. If you're a customer in this situation, what you experience is a contractor, a local solutions provider, uh, your local utility, arriving with the good news that all of the energy savings upgrades that could be made to your home or building can be made without you paying anything up front. And you don't need to take out a loan, sign a lien for your property, or sign a long-term lease. You don't have any future liability other than to continue to pay the utility bills, which are lower as a result of the cash flow positive stream of benefits produced by the investment. The utility puts a fixed charge on your bill that is less than the energy savings from those upgrades. That's how it gets its money back. And if you move away, you have no obligation. The successor customer comes along as I just explained, and uses its benefit stream to continue to take the cost recovery. Tap to the next slide. This gives you a, a snapshot of the entire tariff. The terms of service agreement fits on two pages. It's written in plain Kentucky English because it's already been adopted half a dozen times in Kentucky. Also in Kansas, also in Arkansas, New Hampshire, there are utilities that offer this in North Carolina. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. Simplicity and brevity have been an asset when moving this policy forward because you do have to bring some stakeholders along. If you tap through, you're going to see some green circles come up first. And the green circles are going to show you where these inclusive financing programs using the pay as you save system are already available. And the blue ones tell you places that are already in the pipeline looking for implementation in the next six to 12 months. They're clustered in the southeast, which is no surprise, because that's where we have a heat wave of, of distressed economic conditions that hasn't broken for a century. That is really a, a thunderclap aftermath of the Civil War that I think the United States 
still has some important reconciliation to address. If you think about <clears throat> what's happening in this map, you need to go to a different kind of map to see which utilities are leading. So it's not just the region is important, but to see which utilities are leading. And if you go to the next slide, you will see that most of the utilities leading this frontier on innovative financing that allows all people to participate are actually nonprofit utilities that are owned by their customers, where the consumers and the shareholders have aligned interests. And the electric cooperatives are not known to be progressive organizations. So why on earth would they be leading in this field? And the answer is a little known fact that 90% of the persistent poverty counties in the United States are served by electric cooperatives. So if you were actually trying to open the clean energy economy to everyone, there would have to be a solution that would work for electric cooperatives that serve these persistent poverty counties, or you'd have to keep searching. So what's amazing and exciting to see is that the cooperatives that are leading the way have found good solutions. They're extremely pragmatic and not politicizing their solution set. They're simply going to market and saying, we think we have something that works, and here's how. Go ahead to the next slide. This is an example transaction that if you move through swiftly to show the full set of lines, you'll see that in Kentucky there was a, a program operator that authorized a $10,000 investment at a place where the cost recovery would be 15 years. Their cost of capital, as most utilities cost of capital, is very low. The estimated savings was $100 a month, and the charge for cost recovery was 70 That left that customer with $350 of additional cash per year which in a place where the household income may be, you know, barely $1,000 a month, that's actually uh, an outstanding opportunity for them, even if their household income was $2,000 a month. It's still a source of relief when it comes to the cyclical patterns of seasonal energy poverty that we see with high energy bills in the winter. Moving ahead to the next slide, so you can say, well, that looks like a loan. Well, the profile of the map looks like a loan, but if you see here the attributes of a loan-based transaction compared to a tariff, they're very different. Here's where I'll need to leave, this, leave the scholars among you to uh, use the PDF to study this table later. What I really want to show you is the next slide about not only that a tariff-based term is different than a loan, but that you get different results. And so here is a graph that shows you what happens when you move away from debt-based instruments and use tariff-inclusive financing terms instead? Basically, the first thing that happens is twice as many customers are eligible. And then when they get the opportunity to participate, they say yes five times as often, or the majority of the customers in every utility program that's built on this model, more than half of the customers that receive the utilities offer to invest accept it. And it's not only that they say yes, when they say yes, they say yes to bigger projects that we see for savings because the risk profile for them is so much lower. And these three factors are multiplying factors. More customers saying yes more often to bigger deals. That's two times five times two, that's 20 times the capital flow. And you'd think that that would just be theoretically impossible, except for we're witnessing the exponential growth when utilities turn the switch. If you go to the next slide, I think you'll see a case study from Arkansas. That's exactly what's up next. There was a, a best practices on bill financing program in southern Mississippi, Mississippi River Delta that's in southern Arkansas. They had a best practices loan program that they switched to a, a tariff. I think it took them barely 90 days to get that program up and running after they got unanimous approval from the Utility Commission. And though it was a small program, what they showed is when you hold everything else constant, they doubled their customers, they were able to serve renters for the very first time, 100% of the renters that they approached with an offer said yes, and this average project size doubled. So they doubled the customers, doubled the project size. They got to a million dollars within barely 100 days. Go on to the next slide. I think this is the last line in this lecture here, and the point that I wanted to make was that you can do this not only on a single transaction. I gave you a picture of what a single transaction looks like. I gave you a picture of what it looks like to flip the switch from debt-based instruments that disqualify half of our people to something that actually includes everyone, and now to a program that's been running for nearly a decade now, more than uh, 2,000 
approaches, more than 50% saying yes, $5,000 in only energy efficiency savings per site, nearly $10 million invested now, this data is from last year, and over that whole period of time, 99.9% .9 cost recovery, or a risk profile that is 10 times lower than the portfolios of unsecured consumer debt that are being floated uh, in the market space today. So I'll wrap here, hoping that there's a, a stream of inquiries of interest that might follow during a discussion period, but I welcome anyone to get in touch with me. My email is on the closing slide. Thank you again so much for including me today, and I really appreciate uh, Suzanne and the organizers, including Heidi, who have convened this group and helped us all stay connected. My pleasure, Holmes. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to do this, and thanks so much for all your amazing work. Um, and I have a bunch of questions. I'm sure every, everybody does. Just um, please do send the questions in ahead of time so when we have duplicates, we can kind of um, collate them. Uh, next speaker, make sure you're off of mute, Stacy. Uh, Stacy Swan is going to talk about blended finance for resilience. Yeah, um, and thank you, Suzanne and Heidi and um, Patrice and the rest of the organizers for, for pulling us together for this webinar. This is fantastic. Um, and uh, really also thanks to the other presenters. Um, I think the, the range of different topics here is, is very interesting. Uh, I will speak briefly about blended finance and, and in particular kind of around blended finance for resilience. But before I start, um, I, I think it's important to, to recognize uh, blended finance is a little bit of a catchphrase these days, has been you know, on the rise in terms of the lexicon around um, investing in sustainable things and climate-related um, things in particular in the last couple of years. But uh, blended finance approaches themselves can be applied to a number of different ways to finance things. So um, in our first presenter, talked about project finance. Blended finance can be applicable there. Um, in Holmes' project, um, you could apply blended, a blended finance approach there as well. You can apply blended finance approaches in, in raising money for corporations, for working capital for corporate finance. Also, funds and facilities are often um, pulled together with blended finance approaches and, and certainly projects as well. So blended finance is, is a concept per se, um, and what's important about it is um, the source of capital, uh, if it has patience and is able to take higher risks, and the impacts that it's trying to achieve. Um, so I'll start on the first slide and, and really talk about um, why you might consider blended finance approaches. And in, in particular, blended finance is, um, is used um, in areas where you want to drive investment further and faster than would otherwise happen under current market conditions. So if you look at the first slide, um, at the top, um, things that are quote unquote fully commercial, meaning you know any any entity, any project, um, any fund can raise its money. Um, the risk adjusted kind of cost of that money um, allows the the actors to to pull in the financing they need, uh, and it's considered quote unquote fully commercial. Um, that's kind of normal market based financing. If you look at the other, at the bottom end of this, um, at this chart, uh, you have uh, a green box that says public sector or kind of subsidies, um, and in parentheses you have government, NGOs. These are activities that um, have a high public good where investment may not produce the types of returns that the market wants or no returns at all. They may just be something that for public policy reasons um, we just need to invest in. Um, they are um, things that you know, benefit uh, everyone and for which it's the role of certain types of finance, mostly public, um, although increasingly some NGOs and philanthropy step into this space, um, uh, certain types of finance just need to fund this stuff. And then there's a middle, middle area between things that are fully commercial and things that are fully public good, public sector type of funding. And in that area, you, you can divide it into two subcategories um, at the top, things that have um, potential to be commercial. Um, they're commercially oriented um, and they, um, they with, with a little bit of demonstration and a little bit of soft capital, uh, you can move them into the fully commercial space. And, and things that kind of might resonate here are um, Technologies which may be coming out of the R&D space but need to actually be scaled up in terms in, in terms of being commercial, 
uh, commercially viable for the market to finance. Um, and in the next layer, um, there are things that um, are likely to require some kind of subsidy um, and some kind of support um, uh, in order to keep keep themselves sustainable. And so this is essentially a paradigm of the range of, of activities that might be financed by different types of funders. Um, you do this, you kind of think about the, um, your kind of things that are being financed um, in part because we recognize that there are, that the market will underinvest in activities that can lead to high social benefits. Um, it's your classic market failure approach. Uh, but for which, you know, we also recognize accelerating investment in these areas is necessary and the potential for commercial or quasi-commercial um, um, sustainability is, is there. Um, you've used blended finance approaches to fill the financing gap for entities in this, um, in this box zone um, and what the, what the blended finance uh, sources of capital does is it reduces risks for investors and it catalyzes things um, that um, currently can't be fully commercially financed. Uh, next slide. Great. Um, so in this, this particular uh, presentation focuses on resilience and why you might need to finance, use a blended finance approach for enhancing resilient investments. Um, a number of you may know about similar approaches in clean energy um, and climate smart agriculture, certainly in infrastructure. Um, I'll, I'll focus my, my, um, my comments here on um, how you might do this for kind of uh, resilience, but there's a number of different ways you can apply this. So um, at the moment in many markets, there are very little or no dedicated sources of financing for enhancing resilience and, resilience and investment. And there's, there's not a lot of ways to articulate that or quantify that. Um, there aren't as many tools or, or um, um, applications for understanding what will kind of make something more resilient or resilient to a changing climate. Um, sometimes in the financial ecosystem, um, there are gaps at the local level um, where, you know, local financing just doesn't exist for these types of, these types of activities. Um, in some cases, there are gaps at the national level, and even in some cases, there you know there's still a lot of confusion or maybe misunderstanding about what financing is at the international level with international financial institutions or actors. Um, and in the you know in the absence of these types of financial facilities that are providing blended finance for resilience, um, building in resilience and financing resilient infrastructure is not likely to happen quickly. Um, so. Uh, having a specialized blended finance entity um, that works locally or nationally that can help fill the financing gaps, that can leverage private investment in parallel um, with mainstreaming um, uh, resilience efforts across all of the financial ecosystem um, is important. Next slide, please. So when, when would you consider using quote unquote, a blended finance approach uh, to doing this. Um, again, in the first slide, I could have articulated, let's say, kind of a, a theoretical paradigm of, of where the market-based financing activities might sit and where public good, financing of public goods might sit in this kind of gray zone in between. Um, but it is, it is not a silver bullet. Blended financing can only do so much. Um, it is one tool among many to achieve these objectives. Um, and it's effective in, in certain circumstances, particularly where, you know, the market failures that exist um, lead to um, high perceived risks of an activity um, and potentially some real risks. So, um, and where having funding that is a funding source that is quote unquote blended or a blended finance funding source can actually help demonstrate the business case for commercially viable activities. And, and, and um, prove to other investors, both in that demonstration and in the future, that that particular activity doesn't have the kinds of risks that are perceived. Um, it's useful where public services and infrastructure are needed, um, but where public sources of capital are limited, where really you need to crowd in private investment um, and you need, to, you need to have the public patient capital play a risk-sharing role uh, for those public uh, private sources. 
Um, and it can be um, useful where there are subsidies, but they're time bound and commercial sustainability is expected. Um, this one tends to be somewhat tricky in the space, um, uh, you know, in the kind of quasi public good space because subsidies are everywhere. Um, and blended finance is in itself a subsidy. But the idea here is really to um, balance um, the desire to catalyze something with the desire not to distort markets. And when you talk about subsidies um, generally, a lot of the criticism is about distorting markets. Um, blended finance sits in between kind of the, the need to, the desire to catalyze markets and the desire not to um, distort markets. But it's not, it may not be that effective um, where you have a regulatory framework that may not be um, supportive or maybe working against you. Um, and in particular, if you've got subsidies embedded in the system for things um, that are running counter to your objectives, one of the clearest examples of this is um, you know, using blended finance approaches for clean energy where in markets where there's a significant number of subsidies for fossil-based energy. Um, while you may still choose to use a blended finance approach to finance your wind farm or your solar project, um, you really need to be kind of calling out with the public policy makers the fact that their subsidies on the fossil side are kind of pushing, uh, creating headwinds for you. Um, uh, where the perception of high political risk is, is great, um, this is one where you may be able to use a blended finance approach, but you may not be able to get, um, you may not be able to get private investors um, or as many private investors crowded in um, regardless of the success of your demonstration project until um, uh, this, is, this uh, perception is reduced. Um, and in some cases with early stage technologies, um, you might want to not consider using a blended finance approach, but rather look for R&D funding. The next slide, please. Um, so in this particular slide, um, this, this is kind of uh, putting together a paradigm around a bank or a fund or, a, or a, an, initi an initiative. But again, you can use blended finance in a project finance structure. You can, um, you can use a blended finance approach to raise money um, for corporate finance. Um, this one here envisions something that's akin to like a green bank or we call it the resilience bank here. Um, but very, uh, very specifically, um, moving from left to right, we like to draw the paradigm um, around the money that comes in and how you use the money going out. Um, so on the, on the money inside, you might be raising um, your blended finance sources might come from public sources or philanthropic sources, um, but the characteristic that um, is common between the sources that you're raising is that they're patient and willing to take more risk. Um, so in this particular case, if you were talking about a resilience bank at the local level to finance, um, uh, you know, resilient infrastructure, um, you might look to raise money from the federal budget um, or from the state budget or from philanthropic sources that may want to support the uh, low carbon climate resilient um, type of projects that this facility would, would invest in in the market. Um, and then moving from left to right on how you would use the money, quote unquote, the money outside, you would have um, a number of different tool products and tools um, that you might um, put into this facility, or you may have the, you know, the, the, the sources of capital say, no, actually, we just want this to do one thing and one thing only. We want it to do a guarantee product, or we want it to do um, tax credits. Um, but generally speaking, um, having flexibility on the types of products and tools that this particular facility could put into the market ensures that you can actually address the needs of the projects when the projects come forward. So we've listed here co-lending or financing, um, debt or equity. Uh, in this case, the, the kind of quote unquote impact of the blended sources of capital would be to reduce the um, either, you know, uh, the pricing or extend the tenor or allow for greater patience in terms of um, uh, structuring um, the security package or, um, or, or accommodation of, of a number of those things. Um, 
risk mitigation and credit enhancement. These are things like guarantees, uh, first loss uh, facilities, um, potentially underwriting or supporting kind of bond issuances. Um, on the innovative financing, these, these are kind of concepts that could use some sources of levied capital to get them off the ground, either supporting, you know, uh, collecting or aggregating um, tax credits or liens-based financing. And then a lot of projects for which blended finances uh, that are eligible for blended finance may also need ancillary technical assistance or capacity building, particularly if they're small. Um, the benefits that come out of this is um, essentially the ability to finance enhanced or upgraded infrastructure, the things that the blended sources of capital are looking to achieve in terms of impact. Um, potentially fewer financial economic costs, uh, more losses and damages, um, but ultimately, the, the concept here, particularly kind of for a resilience fund or a resilience bank, is to produce more resilient communities, um, including economic, financial, and um, social resilience, and reduce the systemic stress when bad things happen. Next slide, please. Okay. So, um, there you go. How, let, how much time do you need, Stacey? Like, I can wrap it up. Okay. Just, I just, yeah. um, you're good. We're, we're good. We're on time. I just, just checked. Okay. Well, I don't have to go through. Uh, I've kind of talked a little bit about the principles in my in my um, comments, so we can skip this one and I'll go to the next slide. Right. Um, right. So um, these are just, I've also talked about this uh, in a couple of my comments, but essentially the blended finance approach is whether you're using it for resilience, whether you're using it for clean energy, whether you're using it in a project finance um, structure, whether you're putting a fund together, a facility together, um, they're really meant to kind of, uh, 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 they're really meant to kind of help uh, close the financing gap um, and uh, provide some funding that, you know, helps bridge a gap in financing, uh, pricing, structure, tenor, or combination. They are meant to take greater risks by nature, um, and they're meant to enhance credit in many cases, um, or a combination of all the above. Um, and here on the uh, right-hand side, you'll see a couple of examples of some funds that have been put together or banks that have been put together that use this approach. I'll stop there. Um, and thanks, Suzanne, and, and the rest of the organizers for putting together this webinar. <clears throat> Sure. All right. Harriet, are you unmuted? Yes, I'm here, Suzanne. All right. Take it away. Um, thank you, Suzanne, and thanks to Heidi and the other organizers. This is a fantastic webinar, and I, I'm learning a tremendous amount. Can't wait for the discussion. Uh, the project I'll share with you today is Utility Asset Securitization, which is a way to save ratepayers' money, return utility capital quickly, and also provide private transition assistance funds to communities and workers adversely affected when a power plant closes. Next slide, please. So here's the challenge. Uh, Coal-fired power plants across the country are closing, which I know um, all of us on the call who care about climate are, are very supportive of. Um, environmental regulations are getting a bad rap as being the reason um, that, that that's happening because today, quite honestly, uh, the plants are less economic. In 2016, natural gas um, was used more than coal for electricity generation. Natural gas and wind are now cheaper for electricity generation than coal. So more plants will be closing, which does pose a political issue uh, related to the impacts in communities. Next slide, please. When the plants retire early, and that's a goal that um, many of us in the environmental community share, there's still an undepreciated capital in the, in the plant that's owed to the utility and must be repaid by the rate payers. In Colorado, XL Energy earns approximately a 7% rate of return on capital invested in a plant. Ratepayer-backed bonds properly created by state statute so that the bonds meet Wall Street rating criteria can achieve a triple-A rating 
which allows them to also achieve the best possible lowest interest rate, right now approximately 3%. Refinancing a retired plant with this cheaper money creates savings for rate payers. Next slide, please. These bonds are not new. Um, they were first used in the late 90s during the wholesale power deregulation in many states. Most recently, rate pair back bonds were used last June by Duke Energy in Florida to refinance a, clo a closed nuclear plant. $1.3 billion in bonds were issued at 2.7 uh, two percent interest, and the savings to ratepayers will be seven hundred million dollars over twenty years. Next slide, please. Twenty one states already have securitization statutes on their books, but certain revisions would be need needed to per permit even these states to use um, use the bonds for coal plant retirements and also um, for this new approach that we're suggesting, which is providing transition assistance to affected communities. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, let's look at the plant cost structure. Here we have um, the cost. Top portion of the bar is the fuel and operation and maintenance cost, the largest portion of plant cost to the ratepayer. The bottom is the undepreciated capital cost, the investment the utility has in the plant. When the plant closes, fuel and O&M costs are gone, but the capital costs remain. Next slide, please. There are two ways that this capital can be repaid. Next slide. This shows you the traditional utility depreciation uh, with their return, or Next slide, we see using ratepayer-backed bonds as an alternative for repaying this capital. Next slide. Uh, you can see here how the savings works for ratepayers. Um, let's go on to the next slide. In the Colorado project, we realize that these savings could be shared between the ratepayers and the communities and workers where the plant is closed. Next slide. Um, yeah, um, the funds can also be used. No, I'm sorry, if you go back to the, um, it was just that second click on that. Thank you. Um, the funds can also be used for creative um, community identified purposes, like a local revolving loan fund to support local projects and renewable energy development. Uh, next slide. In Colorado, we ran a bill in the 2017 session, HB. 1339 to allow the use of rate pair backed bonds and also create the Colorado Energy Impact Assistance Authority. This is a volunteer board, board appointed by the governor, which would be charged with responsibility of administering a portion of the bond savings back to the affected community. The formula for determining the amount of money that would go to the community and, and the workers is 15% of the net present value of ratepayer savings, which would be calculated and then added to the amount of the bonds that would be sold. When the bonds are sold, that 15% is paid to the authority uh, to be administered back into the community. Um, this particular approach would create millions of private dollars to help with transition assistance. Um, a simple calculation that we have for Colorado is that for every $100 million securitized, rate payers in Colorado would save approximately $53 million, meaning that $8 million would be available for transition assistance. Most plants have multiples of $100 million in remaining capital balances, so on average, we estimated that 16 to $24 million in private dollars could be available to go back to the communities for transition assistance. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, the transition assistance is key because you can see here the cliff effect 
that um, happens when an asset like a coal-fired power plant is taken out of the local tax base. Next slide, the, um, or next click. The, um, the funds from transition assistance can help smooth that transition while the uh, community works to find new investors to come in and put other kinds of businesses into the community. Uh, next slide. Um, what our bill did uh, was simply create, proposed simply creating this financing tool. Um, it did not require any plants to be closed. It would have just made this alternative available should a plant be closed and if the utility chose to actually use the bonds. The process would have been handled at the Public Utility Commission and um, was not intended to provide um, any kind of adverse impacts to the communities where plants are located. We also had a provision in the bill that if the coal for any of the plants was actually mined in Colorado, support funds could go back into communities where the mines were located to help with minor retraining and some tax uh, uh, tax base replacement in those communities. Unfortunately, um, our bill, while it did pass the uh, Democrat-controlled Colorado House of Representatives on a party line vote, um, failed to actually, in the state Senate, which is controlled by the Republicans, um, it failed to get out of committee and get to the Senate floor for a vote. Um, we had pushback from mining um, interests in the state, and there was also concern from communities that the bill would require the closure of their plants, and that was obviously something that was unacceptable. So um, that was a disappointing loss, but we know that in Colorado, with our very mixed political situation, it can take two or three sessions to actually pass legislation that's new and innovative and something that people need time to understand. Um, next slide, please. Here are some of the um, lessons that we learned in the legislative session. And um, for any of you who've worked in legislation, I think um, you understand the need to start early with educating the interest groups. Uh, we also identified the key support that we needed for the bill. And we discovered that the iterative process of feedback and amendment was critical, although unfortunately this time um, we were not successful. Uh, next slide, please. We are currently in the process of planning our strategy for 2018. Uh, we're receiving um, quite enthusiastic support from uh, some of the communities that could benefit from this now that there's a better understanding of what the bill could do for them. We also have uh, great support from labor uh, because unions are particularly aware of the adverse impacts on their workers. Um, we're in the process of consulting with some other states around the country who are interested in picking up the securitization idea and um, we'll be continuing to work on this for the next year. Um, thanks so much. I'll be happy to take some questions. All right. So I just want to applaud all of you on just how innovative the work that you guys are doing is. It's just, um, you know, there's so many barriers out there and you guys are, and they're really tricky to overcome and you guys have found some really interesting solutions. Um, and speaking of barriers, uh, this webinar actually was uh, instigated by conversations we had months ago. And Emily, I wanted to ask you uh, to talk a bit about some of the gaps that you saw and some of your thoughts around them. And then, um, then I'll go to Holmes, and uh, and I'd love to hear more about the what's holding back your solution now that now that you've got such a, a successful track record. Sure, um, I, I think historically we've seen um, project development coming from um, certain groups putting projects together um, and and coming into a community and, and installing a project there. And oftentimes that's a really successful model, but um, I think there's a gap where communities aren't looking internally and saying what types of infrastructure projects do we need for our community and do we want in our community and proactively developing them themselves so that they not only have the 
infrastructure that they want, but are also able to benefit from that directly financially. And so I think to the extent that um, we can um, educate folks about project finance and about um, the financial instruments that are available and the types of investors that are out there and, and how to both um, structure or, or put together, design an infrastructure project so that it will be attractive to those investors and, and good fits for those types of financial instruments. Um, and, and communicate and package those in the right way, there's a lot more opportunity for those communities to um, have more power and more wealth retained um, within their, their communities. So one of the things that I'm really interested in is how we, how, um, we can share that information so that um, folks can develop the, um, the skills and develop the projects themselves in their own um, communities for their benefit. Great. Um, all right, uh, Holmes, and, and you guys can turn your cameras on, Holmes. I think you can, uh, when you're answering, if if, uh, if you're able or, or not. Either way, it's just nice to see everybody's faces. And again, the question I was, I was going to ask Holmes while she's un unmuting is, is, you know, it seems like you're having such incredible success. It seems like, you know, you'd want to, you know, that would scale all over the place. What, what's holding you back and are there any things that are pushing forward? Can't hear you. Something's happening. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Well, the, the answer to the question is, I think that the interest is spreading as two things are happening. One, a fair degree of uninformed chauvinism is being contested by people who don't live in rural destitute landscapes who are starting to take note that the people who told them that they would have to wait to become a part of the clean energy economy or somebody would come back around to them later with a Habitat for Humanity style invitation to participate, they're not taking no for an answer. And they're starting to demand solutions and they're able to see that there are solutions available. What's regrettable is that the investor-owned utilities have thus far continued a old script of anything that diminishes my sales is bad for my shareholders and therefore I'm just going to slow walk it, sandbag it, slow it down. I'm not going to pretend that I even know that it's there. And so some of the civic interest groups have started to get more assertive with them and their regulators. What's been interesting is in the last 90 days, the Climate Strategies Accelerator, backed by the Packard Foundation, recognizing the impact of inclusive financing, has listened to the Clean Energy Works proposal to split the switch again, not just from debt-based financing to tariffs on bill financing, but from financing for energy efficiency to financing for electric vehicles, primarily electric vehicles that are uh, owned in public infrastructure fleets because they have high passenger carry and high duty cycle, so they actually reach the cost parity line first. So to answer the question bluntly, what are we doing to make it go faster? We're actually moving to clean transit. We're spending more time with transit operators and commissioners talking with utilities about how they could be increasing their sales while increasing energy efficiency, accelerating electrification in the transportation sector, and getting more accustomed to using tariff on bill financing for anything that's on the customer side of the meter, including real estate upgrades. And so communities that are interested in eliminating the special packages of asthma and cancer-causing diesel fumes that are delivered to low-income neighborhoods in every major city in America have been quick to say, well, if that's our first step into the clean energy economy, that's a good one. Let's start there. And I think uh, by the end of this year, we should have some good news on the first tariff on bill programs for clean transit that will help bring down more of the barriers of resistance that have been more associated with just a allergic reaction to energy efficiency than to anything related to the financing. That is super interesting. Oh, I don't know if you guys can see me. Um, that's super interesting, especially because 
you know, the utilities are seeing solar and batteries, you know, and, and uh, grid, uh, people leaving the grid is such a threat to their business model. And then you bring in electric vehicles and it's this huge shot in the arm for them. So that's, that's brilliant. I love it. Um, we had, Harriet was asking a question about, and I don't know if, if uh, that it got sent to me wrong, or she's asking, uh, was it, what is the IOU response to this concept? I, I may have touched on it briefly, so I'll be even briefer here, which is that the investor in utilities in New York, in California, Chicago, and North Carolina have been attentive. They have watched very carefully, and I think they understand the numbers don't lie. And they're trying to figure out where and how to introduce the tariff based program in a way that would allow them to gain the most benefit. Uh, that might include focusing first on demand response programs that are very lucrative for them, like Nest thermostats and things like that. But I think time will tell. The investor and utilities understand that the rate of investment on distributed, in distributed energy solutions is increasing. So they either need to harness their business model and be a part of that future or be left behind by it. And they're getting the message. That's fantastic. Um, Harriet, I want to turn to you uh, and ask if you could talk. Um, are there any, I'm just wondering, we have folks listening from all over the country. Are there uh, other states where this has gotten started or other examples that are similar to what you guys are doing in Colorado? Or are you guys pretty unique? Uh, the the approach that we're using has been unique to Colorado in that we're we're taking bonds which have been used for originally stranded assets in the 90s. They were used for pollution upgrades on plants, putting scrubbers on plants, and securitizing that cost. They've also been used for storm recovery issues after the hurricanes. So those kinds of uses um, are where the bonds have been applied before. Um, the approach that we're taking is um, encouraging the early retirement of coal-fired power plants, taking that um, undepreciated capital, securitizing it, and, and using a portion of the savings to go back into the affected community. And that, that piece about having private transition assistance funds is what is ca capturing um, the imagination of some other states around the country. So we, we have had some interest um, from Missouri, from Minnesota. Um, there's some conversations going on with people in Kentucky, and um, th there may be some interest also in South Carolina. But uh, there has not been a bill like 1339 that's actually been piloted yet in any other um, state legislature. All right. Um, I'm getting a text in from Stacy Swan. So Stacy, I'm just going to turn the uh, I'm going to turn the the uh, mic over to you right now because I can't read your text and talk at the same time. It looks like you're wanting to talk more about green banks. Yes, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I was just going to um, I think kind of between the, the kind of examples that Harriet mentioned and the examples and Holmes Holmes's examples. Um, you know, the kind of green bank structure, which is essentially a blended finance structure, just with a, a kind of fancy title called a green bank, which is, you know, a number of states have already um, kind of stood up. There's a green bank in Connecticut, there's one in New York. Um, there's legislation kind of in train in, in, I believe, 20 states around the country. Um, but these are kind of essentially blended finance facilities that could be sources of capital for each of these types of projects and investments. Um, it is, they're really meant to be put together to catalyze things using some public capital, um, and, and the way they're capitalized varies between from state to state, but using some public capital to kind of really um, in, be that patient investor or that source of financing for um, the types of things that, you know, um, Holmes and Harriet have have articulated. And then, you know, just generally speaking, can be used in a project finance structure, can be used to underwrite or, or um, provide some kind of credit enhancement. I mean, there's a number of different ways to use the money in a structure, but um, I wanted to just make the point that kind of the green bank model or the kind of blended finance facility model is actually kind of about putting things together at the local level that can finance some of these examples. Super helpful. 
Uh, Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you. A question for you, Stacey. Thanks. This is a question for you, Stacey. Um, in project finance, we have very little appetite for technology risk. And so we're looking at financing projects that use um, commercially proven technology. So there's been at least one commercial deployment, successful commercial deployment of the technology. And I work in sectors where there's a lot of really innovative, really good technology that's reaching commercialization or commercial readiness now. But there's a massive gap in the funding ecosystem for the, the financing for that first commercial facility. And there are some loan guarantee programs um, that are, are useful, but there's very little on the equity side to, um, to plug that gap. And so I'm wondering um, what you've been seeing in the blended finance world of using these types of um, green banks or similar type funds to fund the first commercial deployment where um, maybe there's some sort of structure where the um, once the facility reaches or certain performance metrics or commercial operating um, commercial operations, then there's a, a that triggers a buyout from a conventional private equity project finance type group. Have you have you seen any um, any programs like that or examples like that in the market? Um, uh, uh, well, um, yes, internationally, um, but not frequently. Um, and I will say um, one of the kind of uh, the unintended consequences of the kind of rise in quote unquote blended finance facilities is that the sources of capital, mostly public sources, but also some philanthropic sources, has gotten a little bit, um, I, I would say they've kind of, uh, there's been a little bit of a, you know, kind of getting lost in the mission type of evolution, for example. Um, you know, the, the ability to take public sources and catalyze private investment um, is also for them, for their own kind of purposes, the ability to maximize their own bank for buck, right? Public coffers are limited, uh, philanthropic sources are limited. They want to maximize the number of, the amount of private funding they wrap into, you know, their dollar can kind of catalyze. Um, but they also have their own risk appetites. And um, in the context of putting, of them trying to put their uh, money to work and minimize their risk, potentially have some way to get some money back, um, the, the, let's say, unintended consequences of those two objectives from some of these sources has been a tendency to focus on concessional debt products or guarantee products. Um, and it used to be uh, 10, 15 years ago, you would see many more facilities or blended finance sources have the appetite for equity. Um, and that started kind of decreasing in the last 10 years or so. And now you're starting to have a lot of people say, look, like in a, in a 10 year period where interest rates have been so low, your concessional, your concessional debt product really does nothing to move the needle on my project finance. Um, financing raise, right? And what could really be useful is some equity. And isn't the kind of function of your money meant to be patient and take this kind of risk? Um, but there's fewer sources out there today than there were 15 years ago that was willing to do the equity investment or the kind of patient equity side of things. Um, we're starting to, you know, we're definitely having those conversations, particularly with, you know, some of the international sources of blended finance, but also, uh, for, for us, it's kind of two different, uh, let's say, kind of use, uh, sources. There's the international sources and the very, very local. Very, very local tends to have more philanthropic money. Um, so some some of the PRI-related activities of philanthropies, program-related investments, where they want to put their money to work, um, they're starting out with this paradigm that says we really want to put some of this money to work in, in non-grant ways so that we can leverage in private investment and maybe get some returns, they're starting out with a paradigm that they're going to do concessional debt. And I've had a number of discussions with those, those folks saying, look, actually what the market really needs is an equity-like investing. And if you don't have the infrastructure to do an equity investment, to be a shareholder, to some board, to kind of manage an equity investment, then make your debt product look like equity and act like equity in the structure. 
um, because that's what the projects need. They, need. they don't need as many guarantees, particularly for what you just described. Um, they may need some guarantees that the equity is more valuable um, in a way. Um, but it, it really has been a kind of, um, let's say, a pendulum swing in terms of like, the sources of blended capital or where their risk appetites have been. And I think the message that I have is that you can never stop reminding them that their function is to catalyze investments further faster, right, than they would otherwise happen. And the manifestation of that, what structure goes out in the product is, is less of the issue than, you know, at each investment figuring out what's needed and how best their money could be used, um, right? So anyway, I don't know if that helps answer your question, but that's definitely something that I've, I've seen and that, you know, we're trying to at least push a number of the folks that we talk to, to to recognize that the function of their money is to take these higher risks. Without it, these things don't happen. There are other players in the financial ecosystem that fill those gaps. Thank you. So one of the topics that uh, that comes up a lot is, and I'm getting a lot of texts and emails from people saying they're learning so much and, and thank you so much. Um, one of the topics that comes up, and it used to be that uh, you go to an energy event or energy conference and, and there were very few women in the room. Now there are more and more women uh, in energy, but still very few women in finance. So do any of you, any of you feel free to, to take this. Um, how, what advice do you have for, for, for other women um, in terms of how to um, increase your confidence and, and enhance your, your um, skills and knowledge in the realm of finance? It seems like you know, a lot of folks uh, start with a policy background or a science background or an advocacy background and discover that their big barrier is finance. And, and are, are we lacking ways? for uh, to self-educate in, in finance. It's a tricky one. It's kind of one of those, well, kind of one of those learn by doing kind of a thing. Is that what I'm guessing? Well, well, I'll take a stab at this. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Emily. Okay, um, so this is Emily. So I think um, one of the things I think is helpful as a conduit in any industry is is it, folks who are already working in the industry to, to be doing outreach um, to um, people who want to move into it or who are um, you know younger on the career ladder and um, and giving them more exposure to it and um, demystifying it also taking you know especially in finance there's there's so much jargon um, that I think it can be off-putting for somebody who's looking at it from the outside. And so the more we can um, break down some of that jargon, because it's not, it's actually not that complicated, um, and communicate that, I think it makes it a lot more accessible and therefore a lot more interesting to folks to, um, to come and get involved. Yeah. Did, did you want to add anything? Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is a, I mean, this is a really important topic, both in the energy sector and in the finance sector. And when you put the Venn diagram together, really in energy and finance, but, um, and the kind of efforts to ensure um, balance and inclusion um, across the sector and up and down within companies, um, you know, absolutely has to be continued. I was in an event last week where someone said, it's like rolling a rock uphill, you can never stop pushing. Um, because it's really um, amazing how far we have to go and we keep making these kind of strides backwards. I think in energy, there are kind of some paltry numbers, and they, you know, in the United States, you know, there's only 14% or something like that of women in senior management in, in power and utility companies. Um, and on boards, you know, kind of 5% or something like that. And then when you think about women on boards or women in leadership, you know, it's not one woman that you need. You need three women at least because you don't want one woman kind of representing on our shoulders single-handedly the perspective of all women, right? This is a kind of about um, inclusion and diversity, not just having a token woman kind of out there. And that's the same and or worse in some cases in finance. Um, 
you know, and, and without kind of that representation, both in energy and in finance and in energy finance together, I think you, you know, we have a long way to go for gender focused programs and things that impact, you know, women particularly internationally and in, in emerging markets. Um, they, they just are kind of somewhat overlooked or could have the potential to be overlooked. So, um, from a very practical perspective, um, I, you know, reinforcing each other's kind of good work, um, you know, celebrating each other's successes, uh, mentoring um, at all levels is very important. Um, when I'm at conferences or, or in meetings where, you know, there's one woman on a panel, um, you know, sort of reinforcing her message when you're standing up to, to you know, ask a question of the panel is important. Um, you know, there's a lot of different small things that we can do, um, but, um, but, but a lot of work needs to be done kind of across and up and down through, all, through both these sectors um, and definitely in the intersection. I, I don't know if there's, um, I think there's a lot more women in energy finance than there is in just finance, but there's still a long way to go. Um, so. Yeah, and um, in terms of, of um, practical experience and, and that kind of thing, I, I've had a few women emailing um, looking for more consulting, looking to switch jobs. And so I just do want to remind everybody that um, the LinkedIn group is up now, and there is a tab for jobs. Um, so we can start posting um, both people looking to hire and looking um, to be hired on that. Um, I think unless we have other questions, I want to give all of the speakers a chance for any final comments uh, right now. Um, and and if, if you've said all that you want to say, that's fine too. And then we can wrap up. I also want to remind listeners um, that if you have suggestions of any sort, suggestions for next webinars, following webinars, uh, please send them to me at Suzanne at HuntGreenLLC.com. Uh, and so I'll just turn it over for any final comments. We'll just go to the end that you guys spoke. We'll go uh, first to Emily and, and then through the lineup. Thanks. Um, this has been phenomenal. I've learned a lot and um, I, I appreciate the opportunity. and. Following on to what you just mentioned about the LinkedIn group and the conversation we're having on it, um, getting more representation in the field. Um, maybe one of the ways we can use the LinkedIn group is for folks to post when they're going to be at a uh, industry conference and um, try and meet up. Just you know, everyone can find a uh, a time and grab grab a glass of wine together or whatnot, um, and that sort of networking I think will continue the cross-pollination and also help facilitate some of the relationships that we were just talking about to help people get deeper into the field. Okay. Holm, any final comments? Hi. Uh, I want to thank the organizers again for giving us this chance to be in exchange like the other folks who've contributed today. I've learned so much from the expertise that we've seen uh, as part of the program, and it just reminds us how rich this network can be when we breathe life into it. And so I pledge to continue to be responsive to people within the group that have an interest in being a part of what I hope will be a very exciting next chapter of the clean energy economy's growth, where it moves beyond the early te technologists, enthusiasts, the uh, folks who can afford it, to everyone who needs it, and I would like to extend myself to everyone in the group um, as someone who provides resources and support if it's something that you think is a fit solution for the challenges that you see wherever you are. Suzanne and Heidi, thanks again for organizing the occasion, and uh, Pat and Courtney for hosting us. Thank you so much. Stacy. Yeah, uh, sorry, my, my mute. Um, so, yes, thank you so much for, for hosting this. Um, I, too, have learned a lot and have um, and, uh, humbled by the other presenters. I think we there's a lot to learn from each other, and I'm, I hope that uh, uh, we could do more to demystify and, and um, spread the word about 
um, how to be more innovative in finance to accelerate, you know, the low carbon transition we need to, we need to make. I'm happy to, I want to also say um, first um, to you, Suzanne and Heidi um, and Pat and Courtney, thanks for this platform and also for pulling us together as a community. Um, this is really important and um, I'm happy to contribute any time and I'm always available to answer questions and be part of any um, organizing that you guys might want to do. All right, and, and any last comments, Harriet? Um, I, I would just like to extend my, my thanks to you and, and the organizers for this great session. I'd like to encourage everybody to um, take some time looking at the slides. I've learned so much and I'm intrigued by the idea that you take bits and pieces from each of the presentations and you can come up with creative solutions for whatever finance problems you're looking at. So please reach out um, if any of us can answer questions um, and don't uh, hesitate to mix and match the concepts that you learned today. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, we will send an email out soon with the slides and the recording and, uh, and information about the next webinar. Thanks again everybody and thank you so much Melissa who was on uh, doing tech support.